Tonight's talk is called Sellers on the Way to the Theory of Category to a Theory of Categories. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> Several decades ago, Richard Rorty suggested that philosophical admirers of Wilfred Sellers could be divided into two schools defined by which of two famous passages from his masterwork, Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, are taken to express his most important insight. The two passages are, first, in the dimension of describing and explaining the world, science is the measure of all things, of those that are that they are, and of those that are not that they are not. And the second, in characterizing an episode or a state as that of knowing, we're not giving an empirical description of that episode or state. We're placing it in the logical space of reasons, of justifying and being able to justify what one says. The first passage is often called the scientia mensura. It expresses a kind of scientific naturalism. Its opening qualification is important. There are other discursive and cognitive activities besides describing and explaining. The second passage says that characterizing something as a knowing is one of them. And indeed, Sellers means that in characterizing something not just as a knowing, but as a believing, or a believing, as conceptually content <coughs> one is doing something other than describing it. One is placing the item in a normatively, in a normative space, articulated by relations of what's a reason for what. Meaning for him is a normative relation, a normative phenomenon that doesn't fall within the descriptive realm over which natural science is authoritative. Rorty called those impressed by the scientific natural, naturalism epitomized by the Scantian Menzura right-wing Solarsians, <laughs> and those impressed by the normative non-naturalism of that semantic expressed in the other passage, left-wing Solarsians. Acknowledging the antecedents of this usage, he used to express the hope that right-wing and left-wing Solarsians would eventually be able to settle their disagreements more amicably and ironically than did the right-wing and left-wing Hegelians who, as he put it, eventually sorted out their differences in a six-month-long seminar called the Battle of Stalingrad. <laughs> According to this botanization, I am, like my teacher Rorty and my colleague John McDowell, a left-wing Sclorosian, by contrast to such eminent and admirable right-wing Sclorosians as Ruth Milliken, Jay Rosenberg, and Paul Churchland. Well, I think that Rorty's way of dividing things up is helpful. There really are 41ers and 36ers. I want here to explore a different thread that runs through Seller's discussion of some of the same issues. I'm going to start by situating the master idea I'll consider in the context of Seller's neo-Kantianism. It's his way of working out a central idea of Kant's. Specifically, it's what Sellers makes of the fundamental idea that lies at the center of Kant's transcendental idealism, his meta-concept of categories or pure concepts of the understanding. When he was asked what he hoped the effect of his work might be, Sellers said he would be happy if he could usher analytic philosophy from its Humean into its Kantian phase. Apropos of this remark, Rorty also said, not without justice, that in those times my own work could be seen as an effort to hold through the way from analytic philosophy's incipient Kantian phase to an eventual Hegelian one. But you'll be relieved to know I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> Sellers tells us that his reading of Kant lies at the center of his work. He used that theme to structure his John Locke lectures, to the point of devoting the first lecture to presenting a version of the transcendental aesthetic with which Kant opens the critique of pure reason. Those lectures, published as Science and Metaphysics, Variations on Kantian Themes, are Sellers' only book-length systematic exposition of his views during his crucial middle period. The development of Kantian themes is not only self-consciously used to give the book its distinctive shape, but also implicitly determines the contours of Seller's work as a whole. I think the best way to think about that work is as a continuation of the neo-Kantian tradition. In particular, I think he's the figure we should put to today in seeking an appropriation of Kant's theoretical philosophy that might be as fruitful as the appropriation of Kant's practical philosophy that Rawls initiated a generation ago. On the theoretical side, Sellers was the greatest neo-Kantian philosopher of his generation. Now, many Kantian themes run through Sellers' philosophy. I'm going to focus on one master idea, 
which orients and ties together a number of otherwise apparently disparate aspects of his work. This is the idea that besides concepts whose characteristic expressive job it is to describe and explain empirical goings on, there are concepts whose characteristic expressive job it is to make explicit necessary structural features of the discursive framework within which alone description and explanation are possible. Failing to acknowledge and appreciate this crucial difference between the expressive roles different bits of vocabulary play is a perennial source of distinctively philosophical misunderstanding. In particular, Sellers thinks, attempting to understand concepts doing the second, framework explicating sort of work on the model of those whose proper use is empirical description and explanation <coughs> is a fount of metaphysical and semantic among the vocabularies that play this second sort of expressive role, Sellers includes modal vocabulary, normative vocabulary, including what he considers the species of that genus, semantic and intentional vocabulary. He also includes what I'll call ontological or categorical vocabulary, that is, terms such as proposition, property, universal, object, and particular. It's a mistake, he thinks, to understand the use of any of these sorts of vocabulary as fact statement in the narrow sense that assimilates it to describing how the world is. It's a corresponding mistake to recoil from the metaph metaphysical peculiarity and extravagance of the kinds of facts one must postulate in order to understand statements couched in these vocabularies as fact stating in that narrow sense, that is, normative facts, semantic facts, conditional facts, facts about abstract universes, and so on by denying that such statements are legitimate, or even that they can be true. Though, to say that they are true is for sellers not to describe them. Both these mistakes, the dogmatic metaphysical mistake and the skeptical mistake, though opposed to one another, sellers' diagnosis is stemming from a common root, what he calls the descriptivist fallacy. That's the failure to see that some perfectly legitimate concepts don't play the narrowly descriptive expressive role but rather a different, explicative one with respect to the practices of description and explanation. Following Carnap, Sellers instead analyzes the use of all these kinds of vocabulary as, each in its own distinctive way, covertly metalinguistic. In opposing a Procrustean descriptivism about the expressive roles locutions can play, Sellers makes a common cause with the later Wittgenstein. For Wittgenstein, too, devotes a good deal of effort and attention to warning us of the dangers of being enthralled to, bewitched by, a descriptivist picture. We must not simply assume that the job of all declarative sentences is to state facts. I'm in pain, it's a fact then. Or that the job of all singular terms is to pick out objects. I think, I have a pain in my foot, and so on. In addition to tools for attaching, detaching, and general reshaping material objects, hammers and nails, saws and draw knives, the carpenter's tools also include plans, a foot rule, level, pencil, and a tool belt. So too with discursive expressive tools. Wittgenstein's expressive pluralism, language as a motley, certainly involves endorsement of the anti-descriptivism that Sellers epitomizes by saying, quote, once the tautology, the world is described by descriptive concepts, is freed from the idea that the business of all non-logical concepts is to describe, the way is clear to an ungrudging recognition that many expressions which empiricists have relegated to second-class citizenship and discourse are not inferior, just different. But Sellers differs from Wittgenstein in characterizing at least a broad class of non-descriptive vocabularies as playing generically the same expressive role. He takes them to be broadly metalinguistic locutions, expressing necessary features of the framework of discursive practices that make description and so explanation possible. The division of expressive roles that I'm claiming for sellers binds together modal, normative, semantic, intentional, and ontological categorical vocabulary in opposition to empirical descriptive vocabularies, traces back to Kant's idea of pure concepts of the understanding or categories, which play quite a different expressive role from that of ordinary numerical descriptive concepts. The expressive role of pure concepts is roughly 
to make explicit what's implicit in the use of ground-level empirical descriptive concepts. The conditions under which alone it's possible to apply them, which is to say, to use them to make judgments. Though very differently conceived, Kant's distinction is in turn rooted in the epistemological difference Hume notices and elaborates between ordinary empirical descriptive concepts and concepts expressing lawful causal explanatory connections between them. Hume, of course, drew skeptical conclusions from the observation that claims formulated in terms of the latter sort of concept could not be justified by the same sort of means used to justify claims formulated in terms of empirical descriptive concepts. Kant, though, looks at Newton's formulation of the best empirical understanding of his day and sees that the newly introduced concepts of force and mass are not intelligible apart from the laws that relate them. If we give up the claim that F equals MA, then we do not mean force and mass, but are using some different concepts. This leads Kant to two of his deepest and most characteristic metaconceptual innovations. Thinking of statements of laws formulated using elite modal concepts as making explicit rules of reasoning with ordinary empirical descriptive concepts, and understanding the contents of such concepts as articulated by those rules of reasoning with them. This line of thought starts by revealing the semantic presuppositions of Hume's epistemological arguments. For Hume assumes that the contents of ordinary empirical descriptive concepts are intelligible antecedently to and independently of, taking them to stand to one another in rule governed inferential relations of the sort made explicit by mo the modal concepts used to formulate laws. For Kant, rejecting that semantic atomism then emerges as a way of denying the intelligibility of the predicament Hume professes to find himself in, understanding ordinary empirical descriptive <coughs> concepts perfectly well, but getting no grip thereby on the laws expressed by subjunctively robust rules relating them. Even though Kant took it that Hume's skeptical epistemological argument rested on a semantic mistake, from his point of view, Hume's investigation had uncovered a crucial semantic difference between the expressive roles of different kinds <coughs> of concepts. Once his attention had been directed to him, he set himself the task of explaining what was special about these non-descriptive concepts. In that regard, following you. Two features of Kant's account of the expressive role distinctive of the special class of concepts to which Hume directed his attention are of particular importance for the story I have here. The non-descriptive concepts are categorial concepts, and they're pure concepts. To say they're categorial in this context means they make explicit aspects of the form of the conceptual as such. For Kant, concepts are functions of judgment. That is, they would be understood in terms of their role in judging. Categorial concepts express structural features of empirical descriptive judgments. What they make explicit is implicit in the capacity to make any empirical judgments at all. That's what I meant when I said a minute ago that rather than describing how the world is, the expressive job of these concepts is to make explicit necessary features of the framework of discursive practices within which it's possible to describe how the world is. The paradigm here is the elithic modal concepts that articulate the subjunctively robust consequential relations among descriptive concepts. It's those relations that make possible explanation <coughs> of, why one descript, of why one description applies because another does. That force necessarily equals the product of mass and acceleration means that one can explain the specific acceleration of a given mass by describing the force that was applied to it. To say that these concepts are pure is to say that they're available to concept users a priori. Since what they express is implicit in any and every use of concepts to make empirical judgments, there's no particular such concept one must have or judgment one must make in order to be able to deploy the pure concepts of the understanding. To say that the judges can grasp these pure concepts a priori is not to say that they're immediate in the Cartesian sense of known non-representationally. Precisely not. The sort of self-consciousness in the sense of awareness of structural features of the discursive as such, that the categories make possible is mediated by those pure concepts. What was right about the Cartesian idea of the immediacy of self-consciousness is rather that those mediating concepts are available to every thinker a priori. 
The GRASP does not require GRASP or deployment of any particular ground level imperial concepts, but is implicit in the GRASP or deployment of any such concepts. The way I will eventually recommend that we think about this distinct, distinctive a priori is that in being able to deploy ordinary descriptive empirical concepts, one already knows how to do everything one needs to know how to do in order to be able to deploy the concepts that play the expressive role characteristic of the concepts kind of picks out its category. Seller's development of Kant's idea of pure concepts of the understanding is articulated by two main lines of thought. First, his successor meta-conception comprises concepts that are in some broad sense meta-linguistic. In pursuing this line, he follows Carnap, who besides ground-level empirical descriptive vocabulary, allowed meta-linguistic vocabulary as also legitimate in formal languages regimented so as to be perspicuous. Such meta-linguistic vocabulary allows the formulation of explicit rules governing the use of descriptive locutions. Ontologically classifying terms, such as object, property, and proposition, are for Carnap quasi-syntactical meta-vocabulary, corresponding to overtly syntactical expressions in a proper meta-language, such as singular term and predicate and declarative sentence. They're used to formulate what he called L rules, which specify the structure of the language in which empirical descriptions would be expressed. For him, Alethic modal vocabulary is used to formulate P rules, which specify rules for reasoning with particular empirically contextual descriptive vocabulary. Carnap's neocontinuism does not extend to embracing the meta concept of categories, which he identifies with the excesses of transcendental idealism. But in the expressions Carnap classifies as overtly or covertly meta linguistic, Sellers sees the raw materials for a more thoroughly Kantian successor conception to the idea of pure categories of the understanding. The second strand guiding Sellers' reconceptualization of Kantian categories is his semantic inferentialist approach to understanding the contents of descriptive concepts. Sellers picks up Kant's rejection of the semantic atomism characteristic both of the British empiricism of Locke and Hume that Kant was reacting to and of the logical empiricism of Carnap that Sellers was reacting to. The way he works out the anti-atomist lesson he learns from Kant is in terms of the essential contribution made to the contents of ordinary empirical descriptive concepts by the inferential connections among them appealed to in explanations of why some descriptions apply to something in terms of what other descriptions apply to it. Sellers says, quote, Although describing and explaining are distinguishable, they're also, in an important sense, inseparable. It's only because the expressions in terms of which we describe objects locate those objects in a space of implications that they describe at all, rather than merely label. The descriptive and explanatory resources of language advance hand in hand. This, I think, is a rich and suggestive passage, and it's worth unpacking some of the claims it contains. It's framed by a distinction between a weaker notion, labeling, and a stronger one, describing. By labeling, Sellers means discriminating in the sense of responding differentially. A linguistic expression is used as a label if its whole use is specified by the circumstances under which it's appropriately applied, the antecedents of its application. We might distinguish between three kinds of labels depending on how we think of these circumstances or antecedents. First, you could look at what stimuli as a matter of fact elicit, or in fact have elicited, the response that's being understood as the application of a label. Second, one could look dispositionally at what stimuli would elicit the application of a label. Third, one could look at the circumstances in which the label is appropriately applied. What these three senses have in common is that they look only upstream to the situations that have, would, or should prompt the use of the, of the label. The first provides no constraint on future applications of the label. Case of Asara, as familiar gerrymandering arguments that going on in the same way remind us. The second doesn't fund a notion of mistaken application. However one is supposed to apply the label, is disposed to apply the label as proper, as arguments summarized under the heading of disjunctivitis make clear. Only the third, normatively richer sense in which the semantics of a label consists of its circumstances of correct or appropriate application, however one understands those proprieties, 
makes intelligible a notion of mislabeling. But Sellers wants to distinguish describing from labeling in all these senses, including the normatively richer one. The idea is that since labeling of any of these sorts looks only to the circumstances in which the label is, would be, or should be applied, expressions used with the semantics characteristic of labels address at most one of the two fundamental aspects of the use characteristic of descriptions. The rules for the use of labels tell us something about what is, or would, or should be, in effect, so described. But they say nothing at all about what it's described as. But that depends on the consequences of applying one description rather than another. The semantics of genuine descriptions must look downstream as well as upstream. It's this additional feature of their use that distinguishes descriptions from labels. One might quibble verbally with sellers using label and description to describe expressions whose semantics depends on only one or on both of these dimensions of use, but it seems clear that a real semantic distinction is being marked. Making a further move, Sellers understands those consequences of application of descriptions as essentially involving inferential relations to other descriptive concepts. That's what he means by saying that what distinguishes descriptions from their labels is their situation in a space of implications. We can think of these implications as specifying what other descriptions do, would, or should follow from the application of the initial, perhaps responsibly elicited, description. And, and as he's thinking of things, a description correctly applies to a range of things which are described by it. For descriptive concepts used observationally, including those that are appropriately non-inferentially differentially responded to by applying the concept. And it describes them as something from which a further set of descriptions correctly follows. Crucially, these further descriptions can themselves involve applications of descriptive concepts that also have non-inferential, that is observational, circumstances of application. Descriptive concepts that have only inferential circumstances of appropriate application, he calls theoretical concepts. In the opening sentence of the passage I read, Sellers includes understanding as one of the phenomena it takes to be intricated with description in the way explaining is. Understanding a descriptive concept requires being able to place it in the space of implications, partly in virtue of which it is the content that it does. This is in general a kind of knowing how rather than a kind of knowing that. Being able to distinguish in practice the circumstances and consequences of application of the concept when it's appropriately applied, and what would follow from so applying it. Grasping a concept in this sense is not an all or none thing. The ornithologist knows her way around inferentially in the vicinity of terms such as ignorant and passery much better than I do. A consequence of this way of understanding understanding is the holistic conclusion that one cannot grasp one concept without grasping many. This is Seller's way of developing Kant's anti-atomist semantic insight. Taking yet a further step, Sellers also thinks that the inferences articulating the consequences of concepts used descriptively must always include subjunctively robust inferences. That is, the inferences making up the space of implications in virtue of which descriptive concepts have not only potentially atomistic circumstances of application, but also non-atomistic relational consequences of application must extend to what other descriptions would be applicable if a given set of descriptions were applicable. For what Sellers means by explanation is understanding the applicability of some descriptions as explained by the applicability of others according to just this kind of subjunctively robust counterfactual supporting inference. And that is, of course, just the sort of inferential connection that Hume's empiricist atomistic semantics for descriptive concepts, construing them as labels, could not underwrite. Sellers' conception of descriptions as distinguished from labels is his way of following out what he sees as Kant's anti-atomist semantic insight. Modal concepts make explicit these necessary inferential consequential connections between descriptive concepts. They thereby perform the expressive role characteristic of Kantian categories, expressing essential features of the framework within which alone genuine description is possible. All of this is meant to explicate what Sellers meant by saying that the descriptive and explanatory resources of language advance hand in hand.
In addition to Kant's idea, Sellers here takes over Carnap's idea of understanding concepts, whose paradigm is modal concepts, as, in some sense, metalinguistic. The principal class of genuinely intelligible, non-defective, non-descriptive vocabulary that Carnap allows in the logical syntax of language is syntactic metavocabulary, and what he there calls quasi-syntactic vocabulary, which is covertly metalinguistic. For Sellers, the rules which modal vocabulary expresses are rules for deploying linguistic locutions. Their rulishness is their subjunctive robustness. Following out this line of thought, Sellers takes that the grasp of a concept is mastery of the use of a word. He then understands the metalinguistic features in question in terms of rules of inference, whose paradigms are Carnap's L rules and P rules. His generic term for the inferences that articulate the contents of ordinary empirical descriptive concepts is material inferences. The term is chosen to contrast with inferences that are formal in the sense of depending on logical form. In another early essay, he lays out the options he considers like this. We've been led to distinguish the following six conceptions of the states of material rules of inference. First, material rules are as essential to meaning as formal rules, contributing to the architectural detail of its structure within the flying buttresses of logical form. Two, while not essential to meaning, material rules of inference have an original authority, not derived from formal rules, and play an indispensable role in our thinking of matters of fact. Three is the same as two, say that the acknowledgement of material rules of inference is held to be a dispensable feature of thought, at best a matter of convenience. Four, material rules of inference have a purely derivative authority, though they are genuinely rules of inference. Five, the sentences which raise these puzzles about material rules of inference are merely abridged formulations of logically valid inferences. Six, trains of thought which are said to be governed by material rules of inference are actually not inferences at all but rather activated associations, which mimic inference, concealing their intellectual nudity with stolen barriers. His own position is that expression has conceptual content conferred on it by being caught up in, playing a certain role in material inferences. He says, quote, it's the first of rationalistic alternative to which we are committed. According to him, material transformation rules determine the descriptive meaning of the expressions of a language within the framework provided by its logical transformation rules. In traditional language, the content of concepts as well as their logical form is determined by the rules of the understanding. By traditional language here, he means Kant's language. The talk of transformation rules is, of course, Carnapian. In fact, in this essay, Sellers identifies his material rules of inference with Carnap's P rules. <coughs> As already indicated, the material inferential rules that in one or another of these senses determine the descriptive meanings of expressions are for sellers just the subjunctively robust, hence explanation supporting ones. As he puts the point in the title of a long essay, he construes concepts as involving laws and inconceivable without them. This is his response to Quine's implicit challenge in Two Daughters of Empiricism to say what features of their use distinguishes inference determining conceptual contents from those that simply register matters of fact. For sellers, it's precisely their subjunctive robustness, which can, but need not, manifest itself in the form of their lawfulness. Since empirical inquiry is generally, gen generally required to determine what laws govern concepts, such as copper, temperature, and mass, sellers accepts the consequence that it plays the role not only in determining facts, but also of improving our conceptions. Empirical inquiry is required to know the content of our concepts, to teach us more about the concepts that articulate those facts by teaching us more about what really follows from them. On this way of understanding conceptual content, the modal concepts that express the lawfulness of connections among concepts and so underwrite subjunctively robust implications Concepts such as law, necessity, and what's expressed by the use of the subjunctive mood have a different status from those of ordinary empirical descriptive concepts. Rather than in the first instance describing how the world is, they make explicit features of the framework that make such description possible. Because they play this distinctive framework explicating role, 
what they express must be implicitly understood by anyone who can deploy any ground level descriptive concepts. As I want to put the point, in knowing how to, that is being able to use any ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary, each interlocutor already knows how to do everything she needs to know how to do in order to be able to deploy the modal locutions to register the subjunctive robustness of the inferences that determine the contents of the descriptive concepts that vocabulary expresses. This is what Kant's idea that the pure concepts of the understanding are knowable a priori becomes when transposed into Seller's framework. The two lines of thought that orient Seller's treatment of alethic modality, semantic inferentialism, and a metalinguistic understanding of the expressive role characteristic of modal locutions are epitomized in an early formulation. He says, quote, I should be interpreting our judgments to the effect that A causally necessitates B as the expression of a rule governing our use of the terms A and B. End of quote. Where the rule in question is understood as a rule licensing subjunctively robust inferences. I've been filling in the claim that this overall approach to modality deserves to count as a development of Kant's notion of categories, the pure concepts of the understanding, as concepts that make explicit features of the discursive framework that makes empirical description possible. The general conception of pure categorical concepts that I've been attributing to sellers develops Kant's idea by treating some vocabularies and the concepts they express as covertly metalinguistic. This Salarsian conception represents his development of Carnap's classification of some expressions as quasi-syntactic. The underlying insight is that some important kinds of vocabularies are not strictly or evident that are not strictly or evidently metalinguistic, are not used only to describe things, but in ways that also depend on the use of other vocabularies, paradigmatically empirical descriptive ones. Now, this is not the place where I'm going to articulate this Solarsian view about modality. I do that in a different chapter of the, of the book this uh, text is drawn from. But, but I can sum up a little bit. The lessons I draw from the strengths and weaknesses of Sellers' successor conception of the pure concepts of the understanding are fourfold. First, these concepts express what I'm going to call pragmatically mediated semantic relations between vocabularies. Second, these concepts play the expressive role of making explicit essential features of the use of some other vocabulary. Third, the proper use of these concepts can be systematically elaborated from the use of that other vocabulary. And fourth, the features of vocabulary or concept use that they explicate are universal. They're features of any and every autonomous discursive practice. I think there are concepts that play this distinctive fourfold expressive role, and a good thing to mean today by the term category is meta concepts that do. Carnap and Tarski introduced the expression meta language for languages that let one talk about languages, with the examples of syntactic and eventually semantic meta languages. In his earliest writings, Sellers also talks about pragmatic meta languages, meaning languages for talking about the use languages, rather than the syntactic or semantic properties of expressions. These would be the languages in which we conduct what he called pure pragmatics. During and after Seller's most important work during the Anima Rabelais of 1954 to 63, however, and possibly influenced by Carnap, he shifts to using the expression semantics to cover essentially the same ground. I think this was a step backward and that it's one of the obstacles that prevented him from getting clear about the sense in which he wanted to claim that such locutions as alethic modal vocabulary are covertly metalinguistic. One vocabulary serving as a pragmatic metavocabulary for another is the most basic kind of pragmatically mediated semantic relation between vocabularies. It deserves to be called such because the semantics of the pragmatic metavocabulary depends on the use of the vocabulary for which it is a pragmatic metavocabulary. The relation itself is aptly called a semantic relation in the special case where one vocabulary is sufficient to specify practices or abilities whose exercise is sufficient to confer on another vocabulary the meanings that it expresses. We could express such a semantic vocabulary, sorry, we could exp 
represent such a semantic relation, mediated by the practices of using the second vocabulary that the first vocabulary specifies in the first picture that's um, on your handout. The pragmatically mediated semantic relation between vocabularies B prime and B, indicated by the dashed arrow, obtains when the vocabulary B prime is expressively sufficient to specify practices or abilities P that are sufficient to deploy the vocabulary V with the meanings that it expresses when so used. In asserting that this relation between vocabularies obtains, one is claiming that if all the sentences in B prime used to specify the practices or abilities P are true of P, then anyone engaging in those practices or exercising those abilities as specified in V prime is using the expressions of V with their proper meanings. This semantic relation between what's expressible in the two vocabularies is mediated by the practices P that the first vocabulary specifies and which are the use of the second. This particular pragmatically mediated semantic relation holds when the vocabulary V prime allows one to say what one must do in order to say what can be said in the vocabulary V. In that sense, V prime makes explicit, sayable, claimable, the practices or abilities implicit in using V. In other writing about this topic, I've used the uh, examples from automaton theory, where we have uh, a metavocabulary that uh, is a pragmatic metavocabulary for, um, uh, say, finite state uh, autom automata, in that you can say in uh, that metavocabulary what something needs to do to be computing the function of the uh, finite state automata. And in particular, but I think that this is not just the way it's useful for talking about formal languages, but for natural languages as well. So the vocabulary V prime then allows one to say what one must do in order to say what can be said in the vocabulary V. In that sense, V prime makes explicit, sayable, claimable, the practices or abilities that are implicit in using V. This is the explicative relation I mentioned as the second component of the complex expressive role that I'm offering as a candidate for a contemporary successor meta-concept to Kant's meta-concept of a category. There are other pragmatically mediated semantic relations besides being a pragmatic meta-vocabulary in this sense, and others are involved in the categorial expressive role. The result will fall under the general rubric that is the first condition namely being a pragmatically mediated semantic relation. Now, I'm talking very abstractly about these relations. I have views about um, uh, what those practices are that are the pragmatic mediated ones. Those are practices of assertion and inference. And so I have views about uh, what's a useful sort of uh, pragmatic meta vocabulary to talk about them. But I don't want what I'm saying just to be accessible to somebody who happens to uh, about those more specific views, so I'm talking about it more abstractly. One such further pragmatically mediated semantic relation between vocabularies holds when the practices that are PV sufficient for deploying one vocabulary, though not themselves PV sufficient for deploying a second one, can be systematically elaborated into such practices. That is, in being able to deploy the first vocabulary one already knows how to do everything one needs to know how to do, in principle, to deploy the second. But those abilities must be suitably recruited and recombined. The paradigm here is the algorithmic elaboration of one set of abilities into another. So, in the sense I'm after, the capacities to do multiplication and subtraction are algorithmically elaborable into the capacity to do long division. All you need to learn how to do is to put together what you already know how to do in the right way, a way that can be specified by an algorithm. And this is something that automaton theory uh, lays out for us very explicitly. The diagram for this sort of pragmatically mediated semantic relation between vocabularies is the next one. The dotted arrow indicates the semantic relation between vocabularies V prime and V. 
It's the relation that holds when all the relations indicated by solid arrows hold. That is, when the practices or abilities sufficient to deploy vocabulary B can be elaborated into practices sufficient to deploy vocabulary B prime. In this case, the semantic relation in question is mediated by two sets of practices or abilities, those sufficient to deploy the two abilities. <coughs> A slightly more concrete example of vocabulary standing in a pragmatically mediated semantic relation this one, I claim, is that of conditionals in relation to ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary. For using such empirical descriptive vocabulary, I claim, following Sellers, following Kant, requires distinguishing in, in practice between materially good inferences involving descriptive relevance and ones that are not materially good. One need not be either infallible or omniscient in this regard, but unless one makes some such distinction, one cannot count as employing descriptive vocabulary at all. But in being able practically to distinguish, however fallibly and incompletely, between materially good and materially bad inferences, one knows how to do everything one needs to know how to do, in principle, to deploy conditionals. For conditionals can be introduced by recruiting those abilities in connection with the use of sentences formed from the old vocabulary by using the new vocabulary. On the side of the circumstances of application, assertability conditions, one must acknowledge commitment to the conditional P R O Q just in case one takes the inference from P to Q to be a materially good one. And on the side of the consequences of application, if one acknowledges commitment to the conditional P R O Q, then one must take the inference from P to Q to be a materially good one. These rules constitute an algorithm for elaborating the ability to distinguish materially good from materially bad inferences using descriptive vocabulary into the ability appropriately to use conditionals formed from that vocabulary to distinguish when such conditionals are assertable and what the consequences of their assertability is. My idea for a successor concept to what Sellers, with hints from Carnap, made of Kant's meta-conception of pure concepts of the understanding is that they must play both of these expressive roles stand in both sorts of pragmatically mediated semantic relations to another vocabulary. It must be possible to elaborate their use from the use of the index vocabulary, and they must explicate the use of that index vocabulary, here, descriptive vocabulary. Speaking more loosely, we can say that such categorical concepts are both elaborated from and explicative of the use of other concepts. In short, I'll say they're LX with respect to the index vocabulary. The fourth condition I formulated above is that the concepts in question must be universally LX, by which I mean that they must be elaborated from and explicative of every autonomous discursive practice, that is, every language game one can play, though one play no other. That is, the practices from which their use can be elaborated, and of which their use is explicative, must be essential to talking or thinking at all. This universality would distinguish categorical concepts in the sense being specified, from meta-concepts that were elaborated from and explicative of only some parasitic fragment of discourse, culinary, nautical, or theological vocabulary, for instance. I take it that any autonomous discursive practice must include the use of ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary. If so, being elaborated from and explicative of ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary would suffice for being universally LX LX for every autonomous discursive practice. Putting all these conditions together yields the final diagram of the pragmatically mediated semantic relation between vocabularies that obtains when vocabulary B prime plays the expressive role of being universally LX by being elaborable from and explicative of practices necessary for the deployment of ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary. The fact that the rounded rectangle label P double prime representing the practices from which the vocabulary of B prime is elaborated and of which it's explicated appears inside the round re rectangle representing practices sufficient to deploy ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary indicates that the practices P double prime are a necessary part of the practices sufficient to deploy the OED vocabulary, but need not comprise all such practices. So, for instance, distinguishing materially good from materially bad inferences involving them is necessary for deploying ordinary empirical 
as descriptive rather than merely labeling. But there's a lot more involved in doing so, using it observationally, for instance. Different categorical metaconcepts can be LX for different essential features of the use of empirical descriptive vocabulary. So, for instance, the lethic modal vocabulary explicates the subjunctive robustness of the inferences that are, exp that are explicated by conditions. Diagramming the expressive role of being LX for practices necessary to employ ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary provides an analysis that breaks down the claim that some vocabulary plays a categorical role into its complement subclaims. To show that the lethic modal vocabulary, for instance, stands in this pragmatically mediated semantic relation to ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary, one must show that there's some practices or abilities, in this case, the past year reason subjunctively or manufacturally, that are first a necessary component of practices or abilities that are second, PV sufficient to employ ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary. Third, from which one can elaborate practices or abilities that are, four, PV sufficient to deploy vocabulary, namely lethal modal vocabulary. Five, it is VP sufficient to explicate or specify the original practices or abilities. Although there is, by design, considerable elasticity in the concepts vocabulary, practices, or ability, and the various sufficiency and necessity relations between them, the fine structure of the distinctive expressive role in question is clearly specified. And in other chapters of this book, I argue that elethic modal vocabulary, normative vocabulary, and ontological categorical category, uh, vocabulary all do um, play this distinctive expressive role by justifying each of the component uh, claims that's marked with an arrow here. What credentials does that expressive role have to pick out a worthy successful successor meta-concept to what Sellers made in Kant's categories or pure concepts of the understanding? At the beginning of my story, I introduced the idea behind the Kantian categories as the idea that besides the concepts whose principal use is giving empirical descriptions and explanations, they're concepts whose principal use is in making explicit features of the framework that makes empirical description and explanation possible. The expressive task characteristic of concepts of this latter class is to articulate what Kant called transcendental conditions of experience. The concepts expressed by, by vocabularies that are elaborated from an explicative of empirical descriptive vocabulary perform this defining task of concepts that are Kantian categories. As explicative of practices necessary for deploying vocabularies performing the complex expressive task of description and explanation, this kind of vocabulary makes it possible to say what practitioners must be able to do in order to describe and explain how things empirically are. They do this by providing a pragmatic meta-vocabulary for describing and explaining. This is a central feature, the explicative, or X in LX, of the complex pragmatically mediated semantic relation between categorical meta-concepts and ordinary empirical descriptions. One feature of the concepts performing this explicative function that Kant emphasizes is that they're pure concepts of the understanding. To say that they're pure concepts is to say that they're graspable a priori. The feature of the LX model that corresponds to the a prioricity in Kant's categories is that the use of LX metaconcepts can be elaborated from that of the empirical descriptive vocabularies for which they are LX. As I put the point, in knowing how to, employ, how to deploy ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary, one already knows how to do everything one needs to know how to do to deploy the vocabulary that is LX for it, such as alethic modal vocabulary, conditionals, normative vocabulary, and ontological classification vocabulary. If we take it as per sellers, the grasp of a concept is mastery of the use of a word, then one need not actually grasp concepts that are LX for descriptive vocabulary in order to de de deploy descriptive vocabulary. But in effect, all one is missing is the words for them. Think of the example of introducing conditions. The circumstances and consequences of application of LX <coughs> concepts can be formulated by rules that appeal only to abilities one already has in virtue of being able to use ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary. Again, think of the example of conditionals. In that sense, the LX concepts are implicit in descriptive concepts. 
It's not that one must or even could grasp these concepts before deploying descriptive concepts. It's rather that nothing more is required to grasp them than is required to deploy descriptive concepts. And there are no particular descriptive concepts one must be able to deploy, nor any particular descriptive claims that one must endorse in order to possess abilities sufficient to deploy the university LX concepts. The class of concepts that are arguably universally LX, LX for every autonomous discursive practice because LX for ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary, overlaps Kant's categories in important ways, most notably in the Aletheic modem concepts that make explicit subjunctively robust consequential relations among descriptive concepts. But the two do not simply coincide. In between saying and doing, I argue that besides modal vocabulary, logical vocabulary, indexical and demonstrative vocabulary, normative vocabulary, and semantic and intentional vocabulary, all should be thought of as LX for ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary. In spite of this extensional divergence from Kant, the fact that the vocabulary that is LX for descriptive vocabulary in, in general shares with Kant's categories the two crucial features of being explicative of such vocabulary and being graspable a priori that makes the idea of universally LX metaconcepts a worthy successor to Kant's premature idea. The fact that Seller's own development of this idea of Kant's takes such important steps in this direction convinces me that his version of the categories was a progressive step. It is a good idea. Well, in conclusion, the general view I've been elaborating and defending is that one principle unifying Seller's thought is what he made of Kant's notion of pure categories of the understanding. Seller's appreciating that besides concepts whose primary function is the empirical description and explanation of objective features of the world, there are concepts whose expressive goal it is to make explicit aspects of the discursive framework within which empirical description and explanation is possible. And at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned Seller's description of his philosophical aspiration to move analytic philosophy from its human to its Kantian phase. Perhaps the most important dimension of that desirable transformation is the normative insight that Rorty appeared, appealed to in picking out left-wing Silarzia, that in characterizing an episode in intentional or semantic terms, we're not describing it, but placing it in a normative space of justifying and reasoning. Seller's thought is animated throughout by appreciation of Kant's fundamental insight that what distinguishes judgments and intentional actions from the responses of non-discursive creatures is that judging and acting are things subjects are in a distinctive way responsible for. And that part of what they're responsible for doing is having reasons for them. About this crucial normative rational dimension demarcating specifically discursive activity, Sellers was never a scientific naturalist. I've been concerned to point out here another, perhaps less appreciated, strand in Sellers' neo-Kantianism, his metalinguistic pragmatic expressivism, as it's on display in the way he developed Kant's notion of the pure categories of the understanding. Thank you. 
But the Kant thought that those rules also told us about the world as empirically real. Uh, and they tell us in particular about the structure of the objective world. Um, but you suggest, though, that this feature of Kant's thought was optional. And I took it there was a kind of implicature that maybe this is a feature of Kant's thought that should be rejected. Something else that you can tell me if I'm wrong about that. Um, and it seemed to me also that Sellers, uh, at some points anyway, seemed to endorse something like this. So I'm thinking of uh, Sellers' paper, Truth and Correspondence, which I'm sure you know much better than me. Um, and there, at one point, he suggests that while Hume was wrong to think of our ordinary empirical ideas as representing their objects by resembling them you know, in a sort of first order way, that uh, he was still onto something, according to Sellers. That is, as Sellers put it, he, quote, put his finger on an essential truth. Um, and that was the more sophisticated idea. There is a kind of isomorphism between two systems of objects. On the one hand, our ideas, and on the other hand, the objects in the external world that they presumably purport to represent. Um, so there's kind of, a, that can be a much more abstract kind of isomorphism. Uh, there's the example from Wittgenstein, which I think is quite nice, of the correspondence between a piece of music uh, and the plastic bumps on the roof of a violin recording. Um, just to remind us how different this is from, say, Hume's much more naive resemblance theory of representation. Anyway, this seemed to be what was, for Sellers, kind of correct in the correspondence theory. And uh, he seemed to think it was important to find a way to combine his kind of inferentialism with this representational or seemingly representational insight. Uh, so I suppose I was just uh, curious, uh, sort of, if I was right to think that um, that was something you, you as a more left-wing scholar, would want to jettison, if it was fair to think of that as a kind of right-wing component, um, and also Maybe, what do you think was driving Sellers to that commitment, and why do you think it was misguided? Was it maybe the idea that without some such isomorphism assumption, it would seem miraculous that our judgments guide us reliably to get around an empirical world in the way that they do, or something else? So, just maybe say a little bit about that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, where I disagree with the um, scientific naturalism that uh, Sellers epitomizes in this into Missouri passage is Sellers understood that uh, remark as explicitly as his way of developing another crucial Kantian uh, element, um, an element of his transcendental idealism, namely uh, the distinction between noumena and phenomena that uh, Sellers, who famously distinguished between the manifest image of our ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary and the scientific image, uh, understood the priority in the dimension of describing and explaining that he's assigning to the scientific image in the Scantium Mitsura as saying, well, his notion of what we should make of constant as the scientific image as presenting the way things are really or in themselves, whereas the scientific, whereas the manifest image, the, the everyday uh, life image, is merely the appearance of that scientific image uh, to us. And I think that's a terrible idea. Um, the Scantium Mazura does not commit you to that. Um, that is a bridge too far in uh, reading, uh, reading, trying to revive uh, Kant. And in the larger work from, from which this uh, is drawn, uh, I argue that that's true on Seller's own principles. That if, if we learn the lessons that he taught us about uh, the relation between uh, sort of use and modality properly, we'll see that uh, strongly cross sortal uh, identities are almost never true. And that in particular, uh, it cannot be that what we're referring to uh, with our talking persons, with our being with our talk about artifacts, uh, are identical to uh, items in the scientific uh, in the scientific image. So there's an ontological project that uh, he has under the slogan of his uh, scientific naturalism that I'm concerned to, to reject and to uh, argue against. However, that isn't the, the dimension of uh, the right-wing scholars that you're 
uh, addressing. Uh, besides the normative relation, the semantic relation of language to the world. It was always very important to sellers that there was uh, an isomorphism, uh, a broad structural representational relation that he understood as not normative, as merely induced by the matter of factual regularities that come to hold because we have the normative, implicitly normative practices we do, but uh, the norms are just playing the role of bringing about these regularities in virtue of which there is this commonality of structure. Now, I think Sellers himself never got that line of thought appropriately integrated with actually either of these other uh, lines of thought we're talking about. But if you develop uh, the notion I was talking about here in, in the way that I, that I have, suggesting that uh, when Sellers thinks of, for instance, modal concepts as covertly metalinguistic, that's the Carnapian expression. He, he does go to some trouble to say, well, they're not literally metalinguistic, um, that they don't make reference to particular languages, um, those modal claims have to be true, we have to be able to underwrite counterfactuals, such as even if they've never spoken any languages, they're still looking at these necessitations. He's, he's able to do that. Uh, but he doesn't explicitly have the conception of the distinction between a pragmatic kind of vocabulary and a semantic one that I'm working with. Uh, the distinction between a meta vocabulary that lets you talk about what we're doing when we use modal vocabulary and a semantic meta vocabulary that would let us talk about what we're saying uh, when, we're do when we're doing that. As a result, he took it that in pointing out the meta linguistic expressive role of codifying uh, subjectively robust rules of reasoning that he took a lethic modal vocabulary to express, that that ruled out there being any representational component, indeed any descriptive component. Now, on the story that I'm telling, that isn't a good inference. Uh, he's giving us an account that lets us say what you're doing in making claims about what's necessary, what's possible. <coughs> if that's related only in very complicated ways to what you're saying when you do that, when you use the vocabulary in that way. Simon's work opened up the complexity uh, of possibilities here, and uh, I think it's possible to, to um, go much farther down that road and reconcile this sort of modal expressivism about the pragmatics of modal vocabulary with a relatively old-fashioned modal realism about the semantics of it, as to reinstate a picture of how by doing what he's saying you're doing in using modal vocabulary, one also is representing structural features of the world. Um, that's a story I tell in a different chapter here, but I absolutely think that's uh, a critical uh, way, way to make something of that form uh, of sellers and uh, a good thought. Okay, great, thanks. So the floor is open for questions now.